A memorial is something that helps us keep a memory of something significant, something that has happened that stays alive in our hearts and our minds. And all throughout the Bible, God has ordained that there would be memorials. For example, in the Old Testament, we're told about memorials such as the rainbow. So every time you see a rainbow, what do you remember? No more floods that covers the earth. The stone tablets engraved with the Ten Commandments, which we still have today. The jar of manna that was to be kept in the Ark of the Covenant, reminding the nation of Israel how God provided for them as they wandered in the wilderness. The New Testament speaks about the Lord's Supper, which we just had the privilege of coming around. And I believe that to be the Christian's most important memorial because it is the specific way that Jesus asked to be remembered. Now, these were all given to remind us of some miracle that God has done for the purpose of helping his people. And so today, I want to draw your attention to another memorial in the Old Testament. Now, it's not one that we talk about very much, but it had great significance to the people of Israel, and I believe we can learn some things today. It's found in Joshua chapter 4, and there we read about the 12 memorial stones. That's the title of today's message. So let me start by just giving a brief background as to what's happening here in the book of Joshua. It had been about 40 years since God had miraculously worked through Moses and Aaron to finally cause Pharaoh to let my people go, as Moses was pleading with him to do. The nation of Israel fled from Egyptian slavery, and then God performed the miracle that we know as the parting of the Red Sea. But instead of moving into this new promised land, the people were forced to wander in the wilderness for 40 years, all because of a lack of faith. So as the book of Joshua begins, Moses has died. Joshua is the new leader. And the time had come for these Israelites to enter into that beautiful land that God had promised to give them. So when Israel crossed the Jordan River, to enter the promised land for the very first time, God commanded Joshua to pile up a mound of 12 stones at that place. What is it that we can learn from these 12 memorial stones and why did God want the Israelites to set up these stones as a memorial? We're going to look at two reasons for the 12 memorial stones and then make some applications that I think are important for us to make today. But before we do that, as we always do, let's ask God for his blessing, his wisdom, his understanding. As we spend a few moments in his word, let's go to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful weekend, and I pray, Lord, that we will take some time to reflect upon sacrifices that have been made that we might be a free country. We thank you for those sacrifices. And Lord, help us to realize that you have always ordained memorials as important for us. And I pray, Father, that you will help us understand what these 12 memorial stones meant, not only for the nation of Israel, but how we can apply some of the things that they learned today. Lord, I appreciate everyone who is here and everyone who is watching online. And I ask that you will help me present this message in a way pleasing to you I pray it will be accurate, I pray it will be according to your word, and that we can learn and grow just because we're here today, and we thank you for that. Lord, help us never to forget the greatest freedom we have is the freedom that you have given us through your son Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, the freedom from the guilt, the penalty, and the power of sin. We have that hope of eternal life in Jesus, and we praise you for that. Lord, be with us today as we open your word. That's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. First reason for the 12 memorial stones in the Old Testament, God wanted to shake their memory. I want to start in Joshua chapter 4, verse 1. Describes what's happening. Now, when the entire nation had finished crossing the Jordan, meaning the Jordan River, the Lord spoke to Joshua saying, take for yourselves 
12 men from the people, one man from each tribe, and command them saying, take up for yourselves 12 stones from here out of the middle of the Jordan from the place where the priest's feet are standing firmly and carry them over with you and lay them down in the encampment where you will spend the night. And then at the end of verse 7, we're told why. These stones shall become a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. They were to serve as a reminder of the miraculous crossing of the Jordan River to all succeeding generations. You see, I, I believe God knows something about all of his people. That's the reason we have memorials. I believe God knows that we have a tendency to forget. That sometimes we have to face bouts of memory loss. In fact, Moses had warned Israel about their problem of forgetting. The book of Deuteronomy was written only a few months before the crossing of the Jordan. And Moses challenged the Jewish people to remember what God had done for them. Now, there are many places in which he has done this. I'm only going to use one verse. Deuteronomy 16, verse 12 says, You shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and you shall be careful to observe these statutes. And he's talking about all the various laws that they were to follow as they were entering into the promised land. So this heap of stones would be a visual reminder of what God did at the Jordan River. Today, the Lord's Supper is our visual reminder of what God did for us at a place called Calvary. Do you remember Jesus every Sunday by observing this wonderful spiritual feast? The stones would also remind the Israelite nation of God's miraculous power. Now, normally, whenever we think about God's miracle of parting waters, we think about the parting of the Red Sea. And that's understandable. Obviously, the Red Sea was a whole lot bigger than the Jordan River. Seldom do we reference this crossing as anything very special. But I want you to notice a couple of verses in chapter 3 of the book of Joshua. Verse 15 tells us that when the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant, stepped into the Jordan River. It was during the harvest. And that meant it was during the flood season. In fact, verse 15 says, For the Jordan overflows all its banks all the days of harvest. You say, well, what does that mean? Scholars have stated that during the flood season, the Jordan River could swell to a width of eight miles. In spots. Now we go to the High River or the Muskingum River, or if you've even seen the Mississippi River, you can stop on one side and you can see the other side. When the Jordan River was overflowing its banks during the flood season, it could be eight miles wide. God was making a point here. He decided he's going to send them into the promised land during the flood season when there was no way that any person could be able to cross the Jordan River by foot. It was to show God's power. And then verse 16 states that the waters that were flowing down stood and rose up in one heap a great distance away at Adam. Now what's he saying here? Once again, to show his power, God caused the Jordan River to stop at the city called Adam. Now, here's what's significant about that. Adam was 20 miles upstream. So for 20 miles, the river was dry. And that left plenty of room for the 600,000 Israelite men, along with the women and children, to cross over on dry land. And then after everyone crossed over, Joshua instructed those previously selected 12 men one from each of the tribes of Israel, to go back to where the priests were standing and take one stone each representing the 12 tribes and bring them to their lodging place. They were to be stones of evidence that God had performed a miracle, that he had allowed the nation of Israel to enter a land that had been promised to them for many generations. So these stones represented a transition for God's people. From wandering in the wilderness 
to having stability in the valley. Now, I'm sure to many people the stones were nothing more than just a pile of rocks, an obstacle in the way. But for the most part, those Israelite people remembered when they looked at those stones what God had done for them. Verse 24 tells another way these stones would shake the Israelites' memory. So that you may fear. That word means have a deep reverence and respect for the Lord your God forever. These people were to be reminded that they could not have crossed the Jordan's River without God's help. They could not be where they were by their own strength. That is why the stones were put there. They were a memorial of faith, reminding them that what man couldn't do, God can do, and God did do. The 12 stones reminded them that they had passed from slavery to freedom, from hope perceived to a hope received, from talking about milk and honey to drinking milk and eating honey. These stones were there to shake their memory. Yes, we all have a tendency to forget. And that's why Memorial Day is important. We can't forget the sacrifices that men and women have made for our freedom. And it's also why we need to place some stones of remembrance in our lives today. We need to remember what a great God we have. So why did God want the Israelites to set up these stones as a memorial first to shake their memory, second, to help them to share their faith. Our text indicates here that one day the children are going to ask about the stones. I want to pick it up, chapter 4 of Joshua, verse 6, which says, When your children ask later, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall say to them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall become a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. And then if you drop down to the beginning of verse 21, he explains it even more. When your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What are these stones? Then you shall inform your children, saying, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed, just as the Lord your God had done to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had crossed. So that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, so that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Now, I like what we learn here. Uh, Parents, let me just kind of share this with you. Children like to ask questions. Can you say amen to that? Right? Children like to ask questions, especially why or what for. Don't get mad when they ask those questions. It's biblical. That's what I want to remind you of today. Those Israelite children were going to ask, what in the world are these stones? What are they doing here? Why are these stones here? What's the significance of these stones? These 12 stones became a teaching tool. They gave parents an opportunity to share with their children the faithfulness and the power of God. And God has always encouraged the Israelites to remember the days of old and in order to do that, to ask questions. Deuteronomy 32 verse 7 says this, Remember the days of old. Consider the years of all generations. Ask your father and he will inform you. Your elders and they will tell you. Here's the point I want you to realize. Parents have a God-given responsibility to share their faith with their family. So let me ask you, are your children or are your grandchildren asking you questions? Questions like, Mommy, what was it like? When you first became a Christian, Daddy, was the water cold when you were baptized into Christ? Or I love this one. Why do you take communion every Sunday? That's a great question. And I hope that you can answer that question. 
Where are the stones that represent that God was active in your life, in your yesterday? Where were you when the Holy Spirit got a hold of you and began to convict you of your sins? What has happened in your heart? More importantly, what is happening right now to you? Parents, my challenge is, are you sharing your faith with your children? You've heard this said, as I have too. Christianity is just one generation away from extinction. Some people listen to that and they say, no way. I say, yes way, because that's what the Bible says. In fact, there's an example found in Judges 2 verse 10 that tells us the sad state of the Israelite nation shortly after what we're reading about today. In Judges chapter 2, it tells us that Joshua and those who lived in his generation were, for the most part, faithful to God after crossing that Jordan River and taking possession of the promised land. But then we read this in Judges 2 verse 10. All that generation, meaning the generation of Joshua, also were gathered to their fathers, meaning they died. And another generation rose up after them who did not know the Lord, nor even the work which he had done for Israel. Why? Because it wasn't passed down to them. That's why it only takes one generation for Christianity to become extinct. When mothers and grandfathers and grandmothers and dads don't teach their children what God has done, Christianity won't be here anymore. Can you see how important it is for us to share our faith, to let people know that God is real, that he works in people's lives, he saves people from their sins, and there's a heaven waiting on us? We have that responsibility. And if we don't get up some stones, if we don't make a conscious effort to share what God has done in our lives and in the lives of others, the next generation will forget what God has done. That's why Romans 10, 17 to me is so very important when Paul wrote, so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. We've got to share with people what God's word teaches about Jesus. Faith comes by hearing and hearing this book called the Bible. And it's our responsibility to share it with others. One final point I want to make, not only were these 12 memorial stones meant to be a means to share their faith with their children and remind them of God's power, but the 12 memorial stones were also assigned to the world. Verse 24 says that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty. Like those 12 memorial stones in the Old Testament, our Christian lives should reflect God's work and God's power. Today, we are to be living stones, according to 1 Peter 2, 5, giving testimony to the great things that God has done in our lives. Here's what Peter writes, 1 Peter 2, 5. You also, as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So when those Israelites looked at the 12 stones, the question was asked, what do these mean? When people look at your life, a living stone, many will ask, what does this change in your life mean? You're not the person you used to be. Has there been a change in your life since you've been saved, since you became a Christian? My challenge is if there's no change in your life, then I wonder if you're really saved. Do you remember that day when you gave your life to Jesus? Because that's the greatest memorial stone that you have. And I just pray there's no one here this morning that has forgotten what God has done for you. All I'm trying to get you to see is that there should be evidence that God is at work in your life, through your life, and over your life. Everybody ought to be able to testify this morning that God has been with you, that he has helped you. And when I say testify, I mean give an eyewitness account for yourself what God has done when you face the Jordan rivers of your life. 
point out where the stones are. Be able to say, I remember when, and then fill in the blank as to how God has helped you. My mom used to do that all the time. I didn't realize how poor we were when I was growing up because we always had food on the table. And then my mom would tell me stories about how my dad would maybe give someone some hay and they didn't have the money to pay him. And then mom and dad wouldn't have any money to go to the grocery store and all of a sudden a check would come in the mail from someone that had bought hay from him a year earlier. And she'd tell me these stories over and over and over about how God had blessed us. I still remember that. And it caused me to think this week about what my testimony should be. I just want to share a few things that I remember. I remember when Debbie and I owned no furniture, we were married seven years before we bought our first piece of furniture. Oh, we had a few hand-me-downs, but it took a while. I remember when we lived in a 10 by 50 mobile home. I remember when we were staying at my in-law's house. I remember my first job when I was making $3 an hour. I remember when I wouldn't go to church with my wife. She stayed faithful. I remember when the doctor called me on the phone to tell me it was cancer. I remember when I was working all the odd shifts and the long hours to make ends meet, and God was there all the time. And I certainly remember that day on May 11th, 2000, at 4 o'clock in the morning on a Thursday, when a knock on our door said, your son has been killed in an automobile accident. Now, I just gave you some of my own personal testimony. Now, here's what I want to say. I praise God because he brought us through every single one of those. And I praise him even more because my life has been blessed. I haven't gone through near as much as most people go through in their lives. And I praise him for that. And I know that each and every one of you here today can give a testimony to when God was with you in your time of need when he was beside your bed, when he was in your car seat, in your home, at work, in the hospital, whenever the river was about to overtake you, God dried up the river right before your eyes and kept it dry until you and family. You were able to get across. You were able to get through that tragedy, that trial, that temptation. The truth of the matter is God was and is working things out in your life, taking a mess and making it into a masterpiece and he's still working those miracles today. Somewhere along the way, God has turned your test into your testimony. He has turned your pain into your pride. He has turned your sorrows into your strength. And you ought to be able to point out the stones, that place and time, that moment in your past, that spot in your life, that spark that got you going, that time that you knew without a shadow of a doubt that God was working. Now, we may have to look back to see that. Sometimes we can't see it while we're going through it. But once we're through it, we can look back and we can praise God and give him the honor and the glory that he deserves because he helped us get through our river. Everything that happens to you in your life is an opportunity for you to look at the stones and see the power and the majesty of God. God used 12 memorial stones so that he could shake the memory of his people and help them to share their faith. Today, God can use you as a living stone to be a blessing in someone else's life. I want to share this story I read probably 20 years ago. It's a good story. It's about a young and very successful executive whose name was Josh. And one day, he was traveling down a Chicago neighborhood street. And he had been there many times before. But he was going a bit too fast because he had bought two months earlier a sleek black 12-cylinder Jaguar XKE. Quite a car. Could go fast very quickly. But he was watching carefully for kids darting out from between parked cars. And he would slow down when he thought he saw something. And as he was passing this one dangerous spot, no child darted out, but a brick sailed out, boom, hit that Jaguar right in the shiny back door. He slammed on his brakes. 
His gears grounded into reverse, tires spinning. The Jaguar backed up to the spot where the brick had been thrown, and there was a young boy standing. Josh jumped out of the car, grabbed the kid, pushed him up against the parked car, and he began to shout. He said, who do you think you are? What in the world do you think you're doing? And he built up a head of steam and he continued. He said, that's my new Jaguar. And that brick you threw is going to cost you a lot of money. Now, why did you throw it? And the boy was crying. Tears were coming down his face. He said, please, mister, please, I'm sorry. I didn't know what else to do. I threw the brick because no one would stop. As the tears continued to flow down his face, he said to him, it's my brother, mister. He rolled off the curb and fell out of his wheelchair, and I can't lift him up. And the boy continued to sob, and he just pleaded. He said, would you please help me get my brother back into his wheelchair? He's hurt, and he's too heavy for me. Well, Josh was moved beyond words, and so the young executive tried desperately to swallow that rapidly swelling lump in his throat. Straining, he lifted the young man back up into his wheelchair, took out his handkerchief, wiped the scrapes and cuts, checking to see that everything else was okay. And then he walked with him to make sure that the younger brother was able to get them back home all right. It was a long walk back to that sleek, black, shiny, 12-cylinder Jaguar XKE. Josh never did fix that side door. He kept the dent as a memorial to remind him not to go through life so fast that someone has to throw a brick at him to get his attention again. As the praise team comes forward today, if you're here without Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, don't wait for someone to throw a brick to get your attention. I can't end this message without referencing another stone found in the Bible we read in Matthew 21, verse 42, Jesus said to them, Did you never read in the scriptures a stone which the builders rejected? This has become the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. We're given even more insight later when Peter said in 1 Peter 2, verse 6, For this is contained in scripture. Behold, I am laying in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and the one who believes in him will not be put to shame. We all know today who that precious cornerstone is. Jesus Christ is said to be a precious cornerstone. My question to you is, is he your Lord and Savior?